So I'm very happy to be joined here today by an esteemed set of speakers yesterday. We have Abed Solomon, who is the Global Program Lead for a Health Environment for Healthy uh, Children at UNICEF. And he will share with us how air pollution is affecting children and adolescents mostly. And then you will also hear from my colleague Sri, Sri Ram, uh, what steps companies can take to create the baseline for the, airline, for the air uh, pollution then, and what are the potential impacts when you reduce this through our actions. So Sri Ram is working as a global head of uh, climate and air pollution at the InterIKEA Group. And then finally we have Johan Falk, who is the CEO and the uh, founder of Exponential Roadmap Initiative, who will then speak how uh, and why air pollution is crucial for climate and how that can also go into the climate mitigation and the transition plans. And the, he has a fantastic tool with the ERI playbook that can really uh, share with companies how to do it. So we're going to hear both about the why, the what and the how. So be ready for actually, hopefully also feeling that you can join this movement and make this happen. There will also be Q&A at the end. Roshni will, will um, moderate that. And you have it both online and also for you in the room. You just raise your hand and the mic will come to you. So without further ado, I'm very happy to introduce our first speaker, uh, Abit. So please take it away. Thank you, Christine. Um, I'm f um, so from UNICEF, you expect me to speak about children. That's what I'm going to talk about. So <laughs> because the... Uh, because when, we, when it comes to children, it is children that bear the disproportionate burden when we talk about air pollution. We have um, uh, a couple of reports that we have put out. Uh, you'll have uh, some, some, some brochures you could pick up. You can get access to those reports. But essentially, one of the most recent reports we put out was a state of global air report that we partnered with the Health Effects Institute that basically came up with a statistic that almost 2,000 children under the age of five die every day because of air pollution, diseases that are linked to air pollution. Um, so that's a stat to really think about. It's 2,000 children around the world. And normally, if you look at the average life expectancy, it's about 73 years. It's generally around the world. These are 2,000 children that die every day before the age of five. So that's what we're talking about, the damage that air pollution causes. And when I'm speaking about, of course, children under the age of five, we're not talking about uh, the preterm births that happen. One in three preterm births are linked to air pollution as well. Now, babies that are born preterm have major health challenges later in life. Uh, they have developmental delays and all kinds of other health impacts. So when we talk about the disproportionate burden, we break childhood into three categories across the life course. We look at things in pregnancy, we look at things in infancy uh, and childhood, we look at things in adolescence. And across these different periods uh, of across the life course, you have very different kinds of vulnerabilities. So the kinds of exposures that women can have during pregnancy can have devastating impacts for the growing fetus. Um, uh, in infancy, we talk everybody is breathing air, but you look at a newborn, uh, a child is breathing almost twice, sometimes very early, even thrice as fast as an adult. They breathe much more air, and their respiratory system is simply not developed to actually filter out the pollutants. They also absorb more toxins uh, uh, when, they are, when they're exposed. So these are things, that's why we see diseases that are linked like uh, 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 like pneumonia, uh, which is a major killer of children under the age of five. Um, uh, if you look at in adolescence, uh, the issue about asthma, particularly that linked to traffic related uh, uh, air pollution are definitely uh, major concerns for us. So when we look around the world, and this is uh, about you know, where the air pollution deaths are in children, most of these air pollution deaths are in children in low and middle income countries. So there is clearly an equity issue. Uh, children under five in sub-Saharan Africa are 100 times more likely to die from air pollution related diseases than their counterparts in high income countries. That's a shocking statistic. So when I'm talk talking about that 2,000 children that die every day, they will not die across the world the same way. There will be children in sub-Saharan Africa and some countries in South Asia that will be more impacted. Those are the children that, 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 that suffer the most. Um, 
uh, one in three, another statistic flagged in that report, was one in every three lower respiratory infections in children under five is linked to air pollution. So, so it, is, it is something we are deeply concerned about. In UNICEF, we are an agency that is, uh, uh, our mission is to protect children, and that is why for us air pollution is becoming a key priority because it is the number one environmental health risk. And actually, if you look at all the risk factors, metabolic, behavioral, or, uh, or, or environmental, this is the second biggest risk factor globally. So you have malnutrition as the number one risk factor. This air pollution is the second. And that is a significant, significant concern. So we've been working with UNEP and partners and see how do we move this forward? Because sometimes air pollution is put into this one big bucket that people think, oh, well, how do we protect children? And say, so because there are many aspects when we talk about air pollution. So we put out a descriptor of seven, and this is just going out this week, so sorry, I couldn't get it to you earlier in time. But we're just putting this out to say that, to describe air pollution. And we're looking at household air pollution, which is the deadliest. That's 70% of the deaths in children under the age of five are because of household air pollution. We have industrial air pollution, and there's some devastating stories we see around the globe that Thanks to some environmentalists, they do put it out. Thanks to some media, their stories are, are there. High traffic, densities, hotspots. Yes, we all struggle with air pollution to some degree, but there are certain traffic hotspots that are a major concern. Waste-related burning, which isn't just PM 2.5, but what's in the air. Secondhand smoke, which we never talk about. It's another major risk factor. 39,000 children would die every year. That's not in the statistic that I mentioned before. And then there's certain other aspects like wildfire smoke and dust storms. Again, those are air pollutions, but again, not categorizing the scale. So all of this have got, of course, there is this big, big link to climate change. Sometimes air pollution makes, of course, air pollution is a contributor to climate change, but, uh, but climate change makes air pollution worse, uh, uh, as we know. So we like to believe that every child's death and illness linked to air pollution is preventable. Um, and that means, uh, that means we need to take the actions we need to take on the regulatory front in the industrial leadership side of things, and we need to do the risk reduction measures that need to be taken at the individual level. So with the private sector, we believe, and there's great leadership that several partners like IKEA uh, and others are showing in this space, we're talking about do it well, i.e. adopt cleaner technologies and ensure supply chain compliance, do it better, setting more ambitious targets and reporting on air pollution, and finally change the world where we're saying private sector to partner with the governments and innovate when it comes to green technology. So that's how we're looking at, that's the expectation uh, UNICEF is, is, is building on the, uh, from, from in terms of us on air pollution. Um, so I have a lot I could have talked about, but I think I'll just leave with one overarching ask, and that is what we're saying to governments, and that's what we're saying to businesses, that you put the best interest of children first, because by doing this, you're investing in the future of humanity. So another way of putting this would be by making air pollution the number one priority in the 1.5 degree playbook, we protect children's future from the biggest environmental health risk they face today, and the hazards that climate change will make will make much more worse. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Abhir. Uh, and I can now uh, take the opportunity to share a bit of the story with an IKEA. How did we start off with the journey on clean air? What are the experiences that we see in our supply chain? What are the opportunities and challenges do we see on the agenda? And also, how do we see the interconnectedness of various topics? Uh, to start with, I will just want to give you an understanding of the IKEA value chain. So we take, a total, to, we take an integrated approach from a cradle to grave approach. So just visualize, so we, we are dependent a lot on nature for our raw materials and materials. We convert those materials into finished products. We transport those products to our distribution centers, to our franchisees who then run the stores and who run the IKEA brand in all the different markets. Our customers buy the products, they use the product at their home, and hopefully it comes back into the circularity loop. But today it's not a reality. Many, uh, a lot of the product also end up in waste that you alluded to, Abid. 
so this is how the value chain looks like, and we want to address all parts of the value chain. Uh, when we look at air pollution, and you mentioned about it a bit, so when we look at the overall causes of external air pollution, energy systems are a major source. Industry, you mentioned about industry, you mentioned about transportation, you mentioned about waste. And when we transpose that on our own value chain, we, we are responsible and we, we are also contributing to air pollution across all of these. For example, in energy systems, many of our suppliers are burning coal on site to generate energy. So we need to address those. Uh, in industry, we, are, we work with 1,000 plus suppliers around the world who manufacture these pro uh, products for us. Transportation is a big part. And then also how can we work with external society stakeholders to mitigate pollution from waste. So we are part of the problem and we have an opportunity to be a part of the solution. So that's how we start off. Uh, and then when it comes to our journey, uh, it was through, uh, in recent times, it started through the lived experience of some of our co-workers in South Asia who were experiencing the worst impacts of climate, uh, air pollution as such. And in 2018, we launched something called Better Air Now Initiative, which was again using rice straw to con and using a classic example of using waste as a resource and making new products out of it. But then we also wanted to go a step further and we wanted to measure what, our, what is our contribution to air pollution. But we did not have any methodology to rely upon. So we had experts at the Stockholm Environmental Institute and expertise from the Climate and Clean Air Coalition who helped put together a guide to measure air pollution and how to report on that from a value chain perspective. So we started implementing that and now we reported our first air pollution inventory in FY22 and we did that last year for our FY23 and we will also be reporting in FY for our FY24 inventory in January this year. So we are on a journey when it comes to air pollution uh, understanding our contribution to external air pollution as such, which is the first step to then start mitigating those air pollutions. And now I would want to draw the linkages between climate change and air pollution, and how do we integrate health as a core topic within our climate roadmaps or transition plans. So at IKEA, we got our net zero goals approved by our board last November. So we are committed to halving emissions by 20, FY30 compared to our baseline year FY16 and getting to net zero by FY50. Uh, and these are backed by solid action plans in each part of the value chain which I mentioned about, so very much owned by the business. And there are concrete action plans. So if you look at FY23 to FY30, I want to just take the side examples of two parts of our value chain. Let's talk about energy. Let's talk about production, manufacturing of our products. So we are very much on to phasing out coal and oil-based fossil fuels. And we have an ambition to completely phase out the use of coal on site and oil-based fossil fuels by FY25, with the exception of natural gas where we see an extended use till 2030. We will continue striving towards 100% renewable energy by 2030. In 13 of our production markets, we are striving towards 100% renewable electricity by FY25. So we have these actions pinned down in the business which we are working towards. And then if you also take the example of transportation, there is a big ambition and we always start with addressing the efficiency part. So addressing the fuel efficiency first, whether it is land transport or ocean transport. Then within land transport, can we move more of our goods over intermodal transport than relying on diesel trucks, for example, which is also both saving emissions, but also great for clean air as well. And then also on the journey on an intermediate basis to use biofuels to phase out the use of heavy fuel oil as such. Again, I say this intermediate use because in the long run we would want to electrify our transport. But in the absence of that, we see an interim use of biofuels and alternate fuels as such, which will also help mitigate air pollution in the short run. So we have these set of actions that we have underpinned in the business. And we started investigating if we are on to this journey from FY23 to FY30, what is the impact these actions would have on air pollution? And we were quite surprised by the analysis that we did. Just by working, if we deliver to our commitments that we have on net zero, 
we will contribute to almost a 60% reduction in particulate matter, PM2.5, PM10, uh, and also on non-methane volatile organic compounds. And then also close to 70% reduction when it comes to NOx and SOx emissions. So great for climate, and it would be great for a cleaner, contributing to cleaner air agenda as well. And that really established the interconnectedness of the topic. And in this case, it's asymmetric payoffs in terms of you know, working on well thought through decarbonization plans, which can have a great impact on cleaner air. So that's the journey that we are on to. So we are enabling our businesses and generating insights of what to do, and also guiding them on, not, on what not to do. So we are also having dialogues with our stakeholders in some of the markets, like South Asia, for example, many of our suppliers, when they are phasing out coal, biomass is a good alternative. And we are having those dialogues with them. Why do you want to go to biomass? Why not electrify those processes? And because by burning biomass, we are solving for one, which is you know, solving for emissions, but we are contributing more to air pollution. So always having these nuanced discussions with stakeholders across our value chain. Uh, I also wanted to share that you know, it's not only a, uh, you know, a hunky-dory story of us coming here and just, just thumping. We face our own challenges and opportunities. Uh, we've gotten started on a journey, and this is a journey. Uh, one challenge that we see is that you know, we, we say perfection is the enemy of good. So let's just get started. So when you look at our air pollution inventory today, we have not published the air pollution inventory for all parts of our value chain. So we have gotten started with where we have good activity data. But air pollution is also a very local context subject. We can't, emissions are global in nature. Air pollution is very location centric. And we are improving the traceability of our materials, food ingredients. And when we are able to establish all of that, we can also start reporting the air pollutant uh, impact from the materials, from the air pollution as such. So it's a journey. So we, and we've opted to get started with where we can. And that's one of the message I want to deliver because no one is perfect and we need to get started somewhere. And this is, you know, let's get started by just understanding what is the impact on our operations and where is it that we can already get started. And second, also enabling stakeholders to understand that this is an interconnected topic because we also see in the business that and business is all already so overwhelmed with so many requirements on compliance, on traceability. There, there's just so many things on the plate already. So when one goes with a new requirement, there could be a tendency to be overwhelmed. Okay, this is a new topic that I need to solve for. But then we just discussed about the interlinkages of climate, of impact on children, its impact on nature as well. It's so very interconnected that by working on the right set of actions, you can deliver to various agendas. So more giving a sense of assurance to the business as well that it's not about working on n number of topics. It's more about working on the right set of actions which can have co-benefits across multiple actions. So that's also something which I would want to leave you with. Thank you, Sriram. I pick up there and your focus on getting started because I think that's what it's all about. So I'm um, the co-founder, CEO of the Exponential Roadmap Initiative and we bring together uh, the leading transformative and disruptive companies uh, in the world taking action to halve emissions by 2030 through exponential climate action and solutions because the linear thinking is not sufficient. We have to drive climate action and solutions uh, exponentially. Um, and um, the, the key opportunity, as far as I see it, is that climate action can drive clean air action. Clean air action can drive climate action. They're absolutely interconnected. I think what you touched upon that we need to integrate this and keep the simplicity is really important because, as you said, companies feel overwhelmed on new requirements. So that is essential. What we have uh, decided when we onboard companies, by the way, IKEA is part of our initiative and other companies like Apple, Google and so on, 
Um, we have around 60 leading companies in the front line. Um, we do an assessment according to this four pillar framework that we expect companies to cut their own emissions, value chain emissions, scale up solutions and climate action in society. So a holistic approach. So we sort of represent that in our uh, playbook framework. And these are available, of course, to download. So that's basically the framework we developed the last four years together with our leading companies on defining what is required to be aligned with a 1.5 ambition. So what we will do on the next version is we will integrate, um, we will integrate air pollution in that framework as well. So that means that we put an expectation on companies to, to disclose uh, their, their impact, uh, but also to take action and, of course, integrate it in their transition plans, materiality analysis, etc., in the basic frameworks. Um, and I do think that if we can get a number of leading companies in the front line, we can then work with the, with the bigger networks and so on to influence them to take to take the, the, the same steps. Um, so some of the key opportunities, of course, the general fossil phase out is incredibly important and to remove coal everywhere, which is killing so many people. Um, the second part is, of course, the value chain transformation of personal mobility transportation, just to highlight two key areas. And um, there I see opportunities that uh, clean air can actually lead in cities in particular. How can you actually convince people uh, to shift their way of transporting and moving? I think, I think the clean air argument is is stronger than the climate argument because it's really connected to your children's health. So that's really strong motivator to move to move away from from fossil cars to electrified cars to bicycling to uh, to sharing and so on. So I think there is a tremendous opportunity to work with the cities in combination with the value chains to actually uh, drive that uh, opportunity. And we have some examples of cities in the front line, uh, like Oslo, Bogota, for example. Gent was taking a lot of strong actions to actually reduce air pollution and, and um, carbon emissions at the same time. So uh, we're very excited about this collaboration. Thank you. Well, thank you to all of our esteemed speakers. I think you have brilliantly built the business case for air pollution with everything that you have touched upon. And I think it's pretty plain to see why companies should start to act. So just a quick intro. I'm Roshni Mehta. I work at the Clean Air Fund, and we are a th philanthropic uh, uh, organization that work with multiple stakeholders, including the private sector. As touched upon, we uh, co-founded the Alliance for Clean Air that was uh, co-founded at COP26, where we really want to build a corporate movement around tracking and reducing air air pollutant emissions across value chains. We're thrilled that we have 20 members, IKEA are brilliantly one, um, and 10 of those members have recently publicly disclosed for the first time their air, their air, air pollutant uh, emissions, we're making brilliant progress. So I'm delighted to open up the Q&A part of this session. Um, please do pose your questions in the audience, as mentioned earlier, and folks online, please do also pose your questions. I have a nifty iPad here, which I'm told that the question should just appear upon. But maybe if I just sort of kickstart the Q&A with a broader macro question. As mentioned, you have all built the business case pretty clearly as to why businesses should start acting. And there's a building, there's an evidence building as well. You know, there's a UN report out that says, um, talks about the attribution of commercial act activity on air, air pollution, but equally for businesses as well, what that means for productivity and uh, sort of economic growth, 1.2 billion workdays are lost as a result of, uh, of, air, uh, of air, air pollution, that's a stat out by the World Bank. 
So when the evidence is plain, when the evidence is there, why is air pollution still not higher up the agenda? And what steps can we take to help influence companies? So maybe, Christina, if I hand over to you first. Yeah, I think I mean, also what we're doing here today is part of that. Is first you need to be aware, then you need to understand, and you need to break this very complex topic we heard here by now, it is local also. Yeah. What is happening? What kind of uh, value chain do you have as a company? In the same way as been done with climate, you know, go into, if it's backward, to, all the way to raw material source. Raw material sourcing is the production, is the transportation. It is the, uh, in Kia's case, customers traveling back and forth to store or whatever customer meeting point. It is the end of life. So it, all those aspects need to be in and you need to start to measure. So you need to have a baseline. And when you have a baseline, you get to, okay, here I have my hotspots. This is where we need to act. This is where my actions will bring the most uh, um, change and positive, positive change. So I think that to work on it diligently like that and then integrate it into the business. So this is part of business. Sustainability and air pollution is not something you do on the side. You need to integrate it because both here, Sridharm and Johan, also talking about that it's easy to be overwhelmed. So help to break this into actionable pieces. So aware, understand, measure, and put actions in place. So I think you have to be practical. <laughs> and you need to start now, like Sri Ravi put it so nicely. Mm -hmm. You know, let's get going. And then, you know, when we learn more, we adapt, we fine tune, we go. So this is a journey. Yeah, thank you, Christina. Yeah. Sri Ram, I wonder if you wanted to pick up on any practical steps. You covered a lot in your intro, but if there's anything else you want to add as part of that sort of macro question. Yeah, it's both a cost imperative and a revenue imperative in that sense uh, for, for businesses. Um, and now increasingly we see that uh, compliance is also coming in, uh, which, is, which should also compel. In, in, in Europe, for example, the CSRD is ma mandating uh, reporting on air pollution as such. But uh, not to see this only as a compliance requirement, but uh, to see this as an opportunity as well. Because today, many of these costs are hidden uh, when it comes to the cost structure of a company, because the health of, uh, if employees get sick, and not only employees working directly with a brand, but also in the whole supply chain, that some way or the other we are getting the bill, which is not clearly visible to, to corporates today in the, in, in the cost structure. But it can also be a revenue driving opportunity because cleaner air, uh, in the case of IKEA, for example, if we are located in a city where the air is very bad, uh, would people rather be inside rather than visiting the store? So it will also impact store visitations, for example. And I'm sensing you know, it would be similar for other organizations and not to strip it down only as a compliance requirement or merely as a good thing to do on the side. It's at the core of it. It's to also build business resilience and, and to be, uh, take control of the agenda rather than be reactive to it. Mm. Business re resilience, actually, is a really key topic that keeps coming up throughout this week as well. And Johan, I wonder from an ERI perspective, again, the set steps, you know, you, there's a playbook, it's fantastic that air, air pollution will be integrated in the next uh, iteration of the playbook. In terms of sort of the initial steps we can take to help influence companies, could you describe a bit of the work that you're doing with, with, uh, with your members and the journey that you're going to be taking them on um, with the, the, uh, the air pollution work? Yes, uh, apart from well, doing this type of review and providing recommendations and reviewing transition plans and so on, best practice to, to, to the companies, which we also can do because we have a broad set of companies. So companies can, we can take the best practice from the best company and actually, so that's an opportunity. But the second part is uh, initiating what we call action tracks, basically, where bringing together a number of leading companies driving a particular topic. Uh, and to do that in an efficient way, you normally don't want to have 10, 20. You need a number of really committed companies doing the work in the front line to create uh, the cases. So that would be an, uh, an opportunity. And then we need to find a few companies actually showing the way precisely how you do it, how you do that disclosure and how you do it practically without overcomplicating it. And then how can you create a positive case which could be shared by other companies? So that is what I'm thinking. Could be done practically, yeah. yes, as a next step. Thank you. 
And finally, a beat from a health perspective. I mean, you, you painted a very stark reality of the impact of air, air pollution on children. In terms of where the corporate action piece sits, and you, your kind of key method, my notes, is, my page is scribbles because your points were absolutely fantastic. All of all of the points, do it well, do it better, change, change the world. Very powerful key key message. Is there anything else you think that would help companies start to think about air pollution in a in a slightly different way to really sort of take it higher up on their um, on their uh, deep decarbonisation journeys? Yeah, I, th I, th I think there are some great points that have just been made, and I just double down on the point of being local, thinking local. I think that's a very important point because it's very subjective. We think about air pollution in this big bubble, it's very hard to say what will we solve because it's just so complex. When you get local, the face of air pollution changes, and there are things you can do right away. And I think that is what the focus needs to be. So I want to focus, uh, I want to uh, double down on that point. And then, and then the, the practicality of things, which is very much linked about what you can do, what you can solve today, what's got to wait for a big transformation to happen. Uh, I think if we, could, if we could, and that is the reason we put out these seven deadly sources of air pollution, because it sort of paints the picture that it is, it is hyper-localized, that in my community, where I work, in what I do across my suppliers, there are different faces of it, and that, that is how shouldn't get impacted. So what can we do to change that? We have, for many parts of the air pollution, we believe there are solutions that are already there. They're just not shared equally. And I think we've got to do better in terms of sharing them. Mm. Sharing, that's a really, really good point. Um, so, so I have some questions that have come in, but I also wanted to throw it out to the audience. I think there's one in, in the front row here. Um, if we're able to get the mic over, that would be great. Just in the front row, thank you. Uh, hi, Sarah O'Brien from European Climate Foundation. Thank you so much for this really, really very interesting uh, discussion. I wanted to ask uh, Christina and Sriram how you're thinking about air pollution in terms of the products you put on the market. Uh, at European Climate Foundation, we really welcomed the decision by IKEA to no longer sell gas stoves, cooking appliances uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, and uh, as Abit mentioned, uh, indoor air quality and the emissions from cooking are a really big contributor to air pollution and, and to the deaths of children that we're seeing. And from a climate perspective, moving households away from gas cooking is an opportunity to move households away from fossil fuels as well, and that could be very, very powerful. So I wanted just to ask IKEA how you're thinking about that more broadly going beyond the decision you made in the Netherlands uh, and how to bring other corporates with you to use kind of their market power to bring households along on this transition. Shall I start a little bit and then you turn? Uh, thanks for the question. So the question was then about how do we, uh, it's about behavior, yeah? It's about how do people, in this case, you take the cooking, which is very locally specific, you know, how you normally want to cook, if it's on a gas stove or if it's an induction or what it is. So of course, he will follow closely in the different markets where we are, how are the preferences and how can we be part of also influencing that to a more healthy way of cooking, in this case, then reducing air pollution. So those discussions are going on in the, in the different countries. And here we take them as IKEA into a product development process. We take in all those inputs and try to you know, implement these things like in Netherlands when it's ripe to do it. But also be a little bit, you know, okay, let's go for it, let's try. So there is also a part that is actually about education also. So also again, I think building awareness also with our customers. Mm -hmm. And there's another part, you know, the indoor climate is very important for health. So here, for instance, we'll have now come, we have already you know, the air purification uh, products, solutions, and we are working with more of them to have that in the home and also make it available for the many customers, which means it has to be low price, accessible, and then it also uh, helps to the indoor climate. So I think we can work on both things, both working on improving the quality of the air and then the source of the pollution. Would you like to add something, Sri Ram, to that? Uh, just one perspective that even in the induction hob example, it's good for the climate as well. So when we have modeled, uh, so it's part of what we call product use at home. And when we have modeled pathways to reduce them, and in product use at home, we have, an, we have a goal of reducing emissions by 70% compared to our baseline year. So one of the pathways that we see is to move towards more induct to move towards induction hobs. 
So we have already started doing in all the markets where we have the preconditions. In some markets, gas hobs are still widely used and we are sort of looking at those markets as last, but wherever possible, we are sort of rapidly scaling up because that will also deliver to our climate goals. So again, that interconnectedness also helps. So solving for one is helping the indoor air quality as well. Thank you. I think we had another question, a couple of questions here as well. Thanks. Hi, my name is Rajan Mehta, and I'm, and I'm the author of a book called Backstage Climate. Uh, my question is for uh, Christina and Sriram. Uh, a lot of IKEA products and packaging after use is uh, dumped and goes into incineration or in landfills. Uh, both contribute to air pollution and also to climate change. Uh, one way to address this is through extended producer responsibility. I don't know what your take is on that. Are any initiatives being taken for, by IKEA to push that uh, regulation in various markets? Because that could be a good solution. Should I? Yeah, please go. Yeah. Uh, absolutely, we see it as very critical. Again, uh, going back to looking at it through the lens of our climate uh, uh, goals as such. Today, a lot of, uh, most of the emissions from the discarded products which end up in landfills or incinerated, they end up in the product uh, end of life emissions within our books as such. And we are trying to both work on improving the recyclability of the materials that we put out, but also going back to uh, lending one more nuance, materials is almost, materials is almost 46% of our overall emissions. And we want to go towards a journey of using more recycled and renewable materials. And we don't want materials or products to be incinerated or end up in landfills. They should be part of the circularity loop. We should be able to reuse them. One big part of our presence in New York this week is to work and lend our voice to movements for more ambitious NDCs. It's a great opportunity and we see that we will be big beneficiaries among all private corporates as such because when we have more recycling infrastructure, not only in Europe, around the world, who are able to sort of uh, dismantle products and bring it back into the loop. And of course, it needs to be in tandem with uh, recyclability requirements that also need to be there. Like in Europe, you have the ESPR as a regulation which is mandating that. So we want both to play out across uh, legislations to help both propel the recyclability of products, but we need to have solid recycling infrastructure which is bringing in more materials into the loop because that will also you know, both help us in lowering material emissions, it will lower cost because we don't, it will help nature because we don't need to mine for new materials uh, and it will also help us both in material emissions as well as product end of life emissions. That's one way how we are looking at it but we are re actively trying to engage with policy makers on this topic. I think that's really the part to do. We have to do this together and it is industry shifts we also see here and that we are a supply chain oriented retailer. We sit you know, with the capability of developing the products, distributing them, and then in the user form. And of course, we need to also secure that we do what Sriran said, to get the, the products back in the circular flow. So important is to start, whenever we start to look at a new product, that we integrate what we call circular design, uh, design capabilities. So we look at the product from the beginning. How will it, it intended to be used? How will we make it reused, refurbished, remanufactured, and only at the latest last resort is the recycling of material. You should try to do everything first before. And you need to design that into the product from the beginning. And at the same time, work with advocacy, you know, getting you know, the infrastructure up, both you know, the formal infrastructure for uh, recycling, but also in the informal systems that we have. And how do we then also then work with actually getting the people with us on this journey? This is a big social uh, impact of that as well, I think, also linked to children and so forth. So we need to work on both areas. Just wonder as well, Johan, from an ERI perspective again with your members, is there some, some work you're doing on that sort of collaboration piece as well? Can you repeat that? Yeah, I just was just picking up on the points that, that were just raised by the, uh, the, the IKEA team around collaboration, but also working sort of across stakeholders, including national. Is there work that ERI are also doing on that as well? Yes, it's, um, it's incredibly important that uh, companies come together in terms of uh, influencing and driving stronger policies, whatever can be done. So, for example, 
yeah, one part that we're doing together with partners is how companies can ensure that their trade, or, trade associations are aligned with 1.5, which is one important part of the puzzle because they're influencing the, uh, the national policies and global policies. That's absolutely essential. Um, another stakeholder which I think is really important is of course to work with cities as well. Uh, cities are important stakeholders in actually driving towards clean air as well as we talked about. Great, thank you. I'm going to go to a couple more questions in our final couple of minutes and also give people online an opportunity. So maybe one more question from the audience. Go ahead. Thank you. Hi, it's Christabel from Earth.co, Nature Skills Platform. Um, thank you all for sharing your incredible wisdom in this area and for all your action. Um, I'm interested in your perspective on the role of uh, citizen-led engagement in reducing air pollution. So thinking about human participation, not from the kind of consumer perspective, but from active participation in restoring local ecosystems, um, the need for restoration of ecosystems on the global scale can only occur if that local people everywhere are actively participating. And I think that brands um, and corporates have got a big role to play in activating the people that they are engaged with um, and to lift themselves out of thinking of themselves just as consumers and, and to that active participation place. So, yeah, wondering if, if that's ever part of yeah, your guys' perspectives. Maybe a piece, maybe if there's something from a um, UNICEF perspective on that sort of more campaigning side, um, if there's something you can touch on there. Sure, I mean, uh, we, we can instill change if the demand is there, so I think it has to come from the public, and I think some of the challenges we face is, is um, just the limited awareness that air pollution does not impact everybody equally. So for certain populations, like children, it is extremely dangerous, but many caregivers do not understand the exposure risks can vary. Um, so that's a challenge. A bigger challenge is that the health workers don't talk about that, so particularly in the low and middle income world. So if you've got a respiratory issue and you go to a health worker, the health worker will not ever ask, well, many are trying to do, sorry to uh, uh, just universally say that, but I think we've been focusing a lot in sort of on, on pediatric environmental history. So we're asking questions about, uh, we're encouraging health workers to ask questions about the exposure risks that are there for children in the households. Because until you actually start to talk about that, that will not be understood. That awareness would not be there as to why my child is struggling with a respiratory disease. Um, so I think that is some of the things, at least how we're thinking about it, beyond, of course, talking generally about air pollution, but being very specific and very granular on that awareness and that how it's linked to uh, a child's health. Thank and I you. think also the participatory dialogue, you know, if the human rights due diligence, for instance, you need to know how you affect along the entire value chain that you have. And then you need to bring in the people who have a right to talk and who is affected. So I think that is part of also the conversation that needs to happen that is broader. That companies together with NGOs, with the local community, with partners such as also UNICEF that we work with, WWF and others. And that we as a company like IKEA also have to take, I believe, and we are doing that, to go beyond IKEA to actually you know, work on, on areas that is also not always totally linked to the value chain we, we are in but can actually foster and, and, and create a movement. But I think that the participation and the right for people to be part of it is also going to be more mandated in the due diligence uh, legislations also that we see. And I think it's not only because it's a legality, but we want to have that you know, conversation because that's also where we learn. I mean, we talk about here today that we are all on a learning journey. So we need to talk to the people who are affected. And uh, they have a very important part to play and the voice to speak up. Thank you. We are out of time, but I just wanted to end with one question to the panel. And in three words, what are your key messages or your call, call to actions for the audience today? And I've minimized it to three words because we're very, very out of time. But <laughs> if you could maybe summarize in three words what your call, call to action is today. Understand, measure, and act together. Forwards. <laughs> Hope, um, I'm repeating, together, 
um, and, and change. Thanks. Yes, yeah, sp spread the word and uh, see the opportunity. Nice, thank you. Get started, more ambitious NDC 3.0, <laughs> integrated NDC. Uh, 3.0 at that. <laughs> Perfect. Great. Thank you all so much, and thank you to the audience and all that.